preparing. There we go. All right. Good evening, everyone. Good evening to those of you who are here in person. We've got nine people here, and considering the fact that England is playing Wales tonight and we are winning at the moment 2-0, uh, you knew that already. We just said that, no? I'm spoiler alert. Spoiler alert. Sorry, right? So considering that, you know, we don't know what the score is at the moment so that people will be willing to come out. Yes, it's a spoiler alert that they like to say. Considering all that, to have 10 people here, we have a minion, Shmuley's here. So to have 10 people here, I am deeply chuffed. I'm pardon? We have a minion of people. We don't have a minion to dam. We've dammed already. It's too late. We can't dam again just because you've come. But you know, we're not anti women here. Okay, right. So good evening to everybody in person. Good evening to people on Zoom. Good evening to people on Facebook. Good evening to everyone at Torah Anytime. Quality Torah content, TorahAnytime.com. That's your address. Excellent. Let's get going. Tonight, we're going to discuss a little bit about Yaakov Avinu and his travels and travails in a place called Choram. So first of all, we read we're on page 144 in the Art Scroll, Chomashim. This is... Chapter 28, verse 10, Perikov Ches Pasuk Yud, and the Pasuk reads as follows. Vayetze Yaakov mi Be'er Sheva. That's the opening verse of this week's Pasha. Yaakov leaves Be'er Sheva, Vayelech Chorona, and he goes to Choron. And Rashi asks the question automatically. We know where Yaakov was at the moment because we read about it in last week's Pasha. And therefore, if I were to say to you, I'm going to Liverpool tomorrow, for example, I wouldn't have to tell you, by the way, I am leaving Manchester and going to Liverpool. You know that I'm in Manchester. And if I told you I was going to Liverpool, that would do the job. You wouldn't need to know more than that because that's all you need to know. I need to tell you where I came from. The fact that the Torah makes a fuss about the fact that Yaakov Avinu has left Be'er Shava means to teach us something. And therefore the question becomes, what is it that we are being taught over here? So the second Rashi over here tells us the following. We did not need to tell you that Yaakov Avinu has left Be'er Sheva. We only needed to tell you where he's going. So why do we mention him leaving? Here we go. Elo. I'm going to read the Hebrew. This is, if you're looking in the Rashi, this is the fourth line down in the, from the beginning of Rashi. Magid tells us she tzaddik When a tzaddik leaves a town, it makes an impression. It makes a difference. Shabizman tzaddik As long as a tzaddik is in the city, who hoida, it is its beauty. Who ziva, it is its shine. Who hadara, it is. And again, you know, hadara is another word for beauty. There's different words for beauty. So it's it, he is their beauty, the shine, and its luster. Let's call it that. Yatsumisham, and when he leaves, Pana Haida, the beauty lives, Pana Ziva, the shine, Pana Hadara, the lust, or whatever you want to call it. Those are the three things that leave. And therefore, the question becomes Rav Moshe Feinstein asked the question When a tzaddik leaves the place, it makes a difference. But what are these three terms that are brought in Rashi? Pana Haida, Pana Ziva, Pana Hadara. When a tzaddik leaves a town, as long as he's in the town, he is these three things. As when he leaves a town, these three things leave us. Rashi would not give us three different nouns to describe what the tzaddik is, if not for the fact that each one of these nouns is teaching you something different. And therefore, the question is, what is it that each one of these things means? And what is it that the tzaddik therefore makes in this town by being there? So he starts off with the following. Mm. He actually doesn't start with the first one. He starts off with Ziva. Ziva is the shine. Now the shine is, let's just get it right. Yes. Ziva is the shine, which means you're in somebody's presence. Have you ever been in someone's presence and been entirely in awe of that person? 
So you get, pardon? Long F iris. Very nice of you. <laughs> <laughs> Do you know why I'm laughing? I don't believe it either. Just, <laughs> Maureen's laughing. She's like, what a, you know, <laughs> what a load of rubbish. What a load of rubbish. Pardon? I'm supposed to blush. I know. My, my roommate once said to me, I doubt you'd ever blush no matter what happened to you. I said, it's not true. I once or twice, but you know, in general, it's not, it's not the kind of thing. But what is it? You're in someone's presence. If you've ever been in the presence of greatness, oftentimes, if you've been in the presence of great people, if you've been in the presence of great moral people or great people of even sometimes of financial wealth, right? You start to behave a certain way. Being in the presence of certain people creates a certain atmosphere and a certain behavior in the people that are in their surrounding. So much so that there is a book, I think it's called The Millionaire Mindset. And the idea of that book is that if you want to become wealthy, what you should do is you should surround yourself with wealthy people. And you should swagger like wealthy people, etc. Not to say that wealthy people swagger or not, but that's what they're basically saying. If you surround yourself with those sorts of people, what will end up happening is automatically their success, their charisma, their whatever they do will rub off on you. Yeah, I know. I'm not. I'm not convinced either. Yeah. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, I, I think it takes a little bit more to to make money than than to uh, than to just be sitting next to people that are wealthy. You know, I, I, for me, it's not my thing, right? So, but you sit in presence of certain people, and their behavior rubs off on you. So, you sit in presence of great people. You will talk about, for example, let's say you sat in the presence of a great Torah scholar. Remember this story? One of my favorite stories. I had a friend of mine. Gavin. Gavin went to yeshiva for boys that came from a much more modern background and were looking to sort of grow in the Torah. And we used to go to the yeshiva and we used to learn with them. And I remember going to learn with Gavin in his yeshiva. And then one day Gavin tells me the following story, which to me was, a, I don't know if it's going to be as funny for you as it was for me, but it was a, it was quite a funny story. He said they had Rav Chaim Pinchas Scheinberg. Rav Chaim Pinchas Scheinberg was one of the greatest people in the previous generation that lived in Jerusalem. You might have seen pictures of him. He was famous for wearing many, many talesim, one on top of the other. So it was actually a very, pardon? Tzitzis, yes. And he was actually a very small and slender figure. But when you saw him, he looked absolutely massive. The reason was he was wearing like 60, 70, 80 different pairs of tzitzis, one on top of the other. Why? Different story. Anyway. Now he came to that yeshiva and he spoke in that yeshiva and he spoke to all these guys and they, they're all sitting and listening to him. Okay, you know, you're in presence of greatness, but you don't really know what to do with it. And finally, they get to the point where he's finished speaking. And he says, okay, boys, here's your opportunity. You get a chance to ask Rav Chaim Pinchas Scheinberg a question. Anybody have a question for Rav Chaim Pinchas Scheinberg? Now, here's your chance to speak with one of the greatest people of the generation. What are you going to ask him? What would you ask the greatest, one of the greatest star scholars you'll ever meet? Do you have a question? Do you have something you want to know, right? And the guy is sitting there and nobody is asking a question, but nobody. And it was getting a little bit awkward. Finally, this guy, Gavin, felt, I have to say something. I have to say something because it's just embarrassing when nobody's asking the question. So he goes, excuse me? He says, yes. Can I help you? He says, yes, I have a question for the Rosh Yeshiva. He says, right. What's your question? He says, when you go out to eat, what's your preferred restaurant? <laughs> and I remember he told us his story. We were absolutely, I mean, this Rosh Yeshiva probably never goes to a restaurant. Why would Chaim and Chaimur go to a restaurant? It was just like totally missing the boat. Anyway, the funniest part was, I don't think he understood the question either. He was like, is the restaurant kosher? And the guy's like, the restaurant kosher i mean yeah if you're going to the restaurant of course it, he's like yeah of course it is he goes yeah yes it is he goes well then enjoy it he's like what it was like one of those you know <laughs> we we both totally missed each other but like entirely but when you're sitting in presence of greatness oftentimes the conversation that you're going to have is going to be different not even if that person's leading the conversation but you're sitting next to a great person and you want to talk to them about the thing that makes them so great you'll behave a certain way Maybe you're nervous. Maybe you'll talk differently than you talk naturally. So you get very shy or you talk in a 
much more religious tone or you touch a, you know, respectful tone, whatever it is. But being in the presence of somebody like that rubs off on you. And that's the shine. I'm sitting here, not me, but like somebody great would be sitting here. It'd be like the sun is shining on other people, that you get that shine when the person's there. Being in his presence makes a difference. So that's number one. When the tzaddik lives in a town, his presence in and of itself and people who bask in his presence, it changes people for the good. It changes people for the better. That's number one. Number two, he says, Hoid. Hoid is beauty. Hoid is also, it means splendor, right? The splendor of this person, you take it with you. I.e., when you learn from this person, that's the other thing. The person will teach you something. Right? When you sit next to great people, in general, one of the most important things to do when you're sitting in front of great people is what? Shut up and listen. Right? That's what it is. You got to listen to what they have to say. There's no point in standing in front of a great person and just letting all this stuff out. Because he's like, all right, you want to talk, you can talk. But you're like, you could really learn a lot from this person if you kept your mouth shut and listened to what he had to say, rather than trying to show everybody else that you have no idea what you're talking about. So just sit and listen. But when you sit and listen to great people, you learn. Why do people spend a lot of money to try to come into contact with people that are great in whatever field it is, especially if you're in the same field? Why would you do that? Because you're hoping by being in that person's presence, their greatness is going to rub off on you. They're going to teach you something that you're going to go, that's really important. I'm glad you've taught me that. That's changed my life. That means I'm a totally different person. But that's a really important thing. That's what he's saying. So you get that kind of thing from being in his presence. That's not the shine. The shine is just actually just being in the presence alone gives you that. Hoid, the splendor, is something that you take with you. It's like... When the sun is shining and I'm, outside, and I'm outside, then I'll be sunny. If I come inside, that will disappear, right? It's not sunny in here, even though it's sunny outside. However, let's say I was outside and I sat in the sun for long enough and I got a suntan, right? Then when I come inside, I'm not suddenly going to turn white. That brown bronze color that I got is going to remain with me because it's something that I acquired from the sun. In the same way, if I am with somebody great and I spend the time listening to them, learning from them, I will become greater through that. That's almost an automatic ticket to becoming greater, spending the time with them. And harder is also that, you know, there's a certain beauty and that beauty that, you know, people see him and they look up to him, right? And that looking up to him in and of itself, changes a place. Who are your role models? Who do you look up to? Who do you feel this is the person? If I had a choice, if I could be like someone, who would I be like? What would you insert over there? What would be your answer if I could choose someone to be like? Because that answer says a lot about who you are. Why? Because let's say you said, if I could choose to be like someone, who would I be like? Oh, I want to be like Bill Gates. All right, so what are you saying about yourself? Money's everything to you, right? Because I'd love to be Bill Gates or Elon Musk or Warren Buffett or Mukesh Ambani or any of the other top 10 billionaires in the world, right? Which is really not great. It's interesting. I was speaking, we were speaking about it yesterday because uh, Marty Spitzer sent me the profiles of the two billionaires I spoke about on Friday night. David Lichtenstein and Michael Steinhardt, both Jews, both very, very wealthy Jews. Okay, nowhere near the top of the billionaire list, but very, very wealthy men. And I was looking through it. So then I wanted to see, okay, the Forbes list, so who's on the top 10? So you're looking at some of the top 10. So I was speaking to my son. I said to him, you know, there's a fellow on there. I think his name is Larry Page. Larry Page and Sergey Brin invented what? That's right. They invented Google. Did you have to Google that? No, just kidding, right? Yeah. They invented Google. And they are both like one is number nine and one is number 11 of the richest people in the world. And my son told me, Mayor says, Larry Page is a very, very bitter individual because he wants to be number one and he cannot be number one. 
And we're like, but you're number nine. You got more money than some countries, for goodness sake. You know what I mean? Like, it's just ridiculous. Why do you need to be number one? Yeah, that's mad. It's mad. You know, the amount of money that they were talking about is just ridiculous. It's crazy. So he said, so, you know, he said something very interesting. Either my son says or my wife said this. I can't remember who said this. But they said they have so much money that they never, ever be lacking anything financially. So money doesn't get them excited anymore because they can buy whatever they want to and then some. So it's the only thing that can still get you excited about having money, being number one. Because having money, you know, once you have 50, 80, 100 billion dollars, what are you going to do with this stuff? You know, whatever you want, you can buy and be left with pocket change. Yeah, that's what it is. Yes, I'm on rights my that's true. But here the point is also that, you know, that he can't really, well, you know, what if you're going to get double the money, what, what's double the money going to do for you? Nothing, right? What's half the money going to do for him? Also nothing. You couldn't spend it in 10 lifetimes. Unless you spend it on absolute rubbish, you couldn't spend that kind of money if you tried, right? So what's the point? The point is now it's not, a, it's, it's just about keeping score. But if, am I number one? Because I'd like to be number one. I'm not. So if you are one of those people that says, who would you like to be like? Name one of the top 10 on the Forbes list. These aren't necessarily great people. They are very wealthy people. I can, we can all agree on that one. But wealth doesn't make them great. Yes. All right. Yeah, okay, so let's take Bill Gates. Bill Gates is a big philanthropist. So you can take Bill Gates out of the list and say, okay, I want to be like one of the others that hasn't given as much charity to, you know. But I think a lot of people like to say the following, God, why don't you give me a lot of money and watch how much charity I give? Yeah, that's the kind of deal they like to make with God. I know a lot of people with a lot of money are supposed to give more charity and they don't. But if you test me with a test of wealth, trust me, I'll be the one that passes that test. And God's like, you know what? Let's not take any chances. That's not, <laughs> that's not necessarily true. You don't want to take any chances. You don't know that you'll pass the test of wealth. The test of wealth is an extremely difficult test. And some people say it is a much, much more difficult test being wealthy than it is not having any money. Right? It's a very difficult test. Right? Because having money is a huge responsibility. And you live up to that responsibility. Everything, everything, you know? Yeah? But if you ask somebody, who would you like to be like? And instead of saying the wealthiest man, they say the most pious person, the most charitable person that they know, then you know exactly what they are looking for in life. And so therefore, we have this tzaddik over here. The tzaddik lives in the town. He makes a difference to the town. It's what he is that changes all the people there. Just his mere presence there whether it is people being in his presence, whether it's people learning from him, whether it's people emulating him, whatever it's going to be, but that is going to change a town for the better, right? Take an example. We take two examples here. One example is the Manchester Rosh Hashiva. The Manchester Rosh Hashiva is a world-known or was a world-known figure for you know his great piety, for who he was. And Manchester almost was on the Jewish map, so to speak, because of him. Without him, I mean, today, okay, Manchester is much, much bigger and has a lot more to offer than it did then. But in the 1980s and 1990s, Manchester wasn't the teeming Jewish city that it is today. Didn't have the same Haredi infrastructure, didn't have as many schools, didn't have as many shuls, didn't have as many kolim, didn't have as many chassidish, madrashes, didn't have all these, you know, it was very, very different. So in the firm world, what made Manchester a place at all, right, over many other places? The fact that we had a tzaddik called the Manchester Rosh Hashiva that lived here, that, that put us on the map, right? And there are places where the great man in that town is put up, puts them on the map. And when he leaves the town, it's a real issue. People don't see it in the same way anymore. Gates was put on the map for a long time with Rav Zimmerman. Rav Zimmerman was now the Avbezdin of the Federation when he lived in Gates. For many people, Gates okay, had a lot of other things, but people really looked up to the fact that they had a Rav in Gateshead like the Gateshead Rav that changed around Gateshead from what it was that brought in new things, etc. etc. Because for many, many years it was a town only of Kolo people, and anybody who wasn't a Kolo person didn't feel comfortable there. And he changed the whole thing over there. And, and people really looked up to this person. And when he left, people were like, Oh, what a shame. And nowadays, even though he's the Av Bezdin, 
he's the head of the Besdin in London at the Federation, many people still refer to him as the Gates of Rav. I still call him the Gates of Rav. I don't call him the Besdin of the, because he was for so many years the Rav of Gates. So that's how we see him. And he made an impact on Gates. Rav Aaron Troy, Diane Aaron Troy, who just passed away this week, right? Lived in Manchester, made a huge impact in Manchester. Moved to London, made a huge impact in London. He was a man that wherever he went, made a massive impact, right? Because that was the kind of person that he was. And being in his vicinity changed you for the better. Having somebody as part of your community, as your town, changed him for changed the whole town for the better. A town that has someone as great as that or a town that loses someone as great as that is not the same place anymore. And that's what Rashi is saying. By When Yaakov leaves Be'er Sheva, Be'er Sheva is not the same anymore because with it, Yaakov takes along certain traits and certain characteristics and people are not going to learn in the same way from Yaakov Avinu as they used to. And so we're dealing with a different reality and a different kind of town. Okay? That's the first idea over here. I would also like to mention one other thing that's brought in those nine Torah, and this is a very important thing as well. Those nine Torah says the following. He says, when a tzaddik leaves the town, he's only appreciated once he leaves. I remember, for example, in Eretz Yisrael, there was a very, very great man, one of the greatest in the generation, if not the greatest, for some time, the greatest man generation, whose name was Rabbi El Yashiv. Rabbi Yashiv was known as the man that decided almost all of the big, big halachic questions in Israel. He was like the top, top man, over 100, very, very, you know, knew everything, et cetera, et cetera. He was the father-in-law of Chaim Kanievsky, very, very great individual. Now, Rabbi Yashiv gave a shir every day in one of the shuls. And you'd expect, how many people would you expect to go such a shir? Think to yourself, this is the greatest man. The greatest person in, you know, one of the greatest Torah scholars alive. And Jerusalem is a city full of Torah scholars. It's not a tiny little hamlet. So how many people were at Ashir? Between 10 and 20. That's it. Yeah. I don't know. People didn't come there because you live with him, so it wasn't a big deal. I remember when we were in yeshiva, we had a great Rosh Yeshiva, Rav Nosson Zvi Finkel Zatzal. Rav Nosson Zvi Finkel was an absolute phenomenon. It was something to behold because Rav Nosson Zvi Finkel had Parkinson's and he literally ran the biggest yeshiva in the world by himself. He fundraised for that yeshiva. He had thousands of students. He spent 12 days, uh, 12 hours a day learning. He, when he gave a shir, I still remember the first time I saw him giving a shir. <coughs> it was awe-inspiring because here's a man that had Parkinson's. He wouldn't take his medication because it would cloud his mind. So he was often in terrible pain. And they had, he stood up in the base matter. She had three microphones, one, two, three. And he's holding on to two standers. And he's rocking back and forth between them. And that's why he had three microphones so that no matter where he moves, they're always going to pick up his voice. And he would stand there and he would give a shir and he would have to hold on. And the shir was tremendously brilliant. And yet whenever the Rosh Hashiva would walk into the base of Medrash to give a shir, you know what would happen? The place would empty out. Because people were like, I don't want to hear the shir now. I'm learning. I'm busy doing something else. I'm busy with my, my private learning. I don't want to be hearing the Rashir from the Rosh Hashiva. And so you'd come into the Mesa Medrash. The Mesa Medrash held like a thousand people. And if there were between 50 and 100 people there, that was a good turnout. Yet, when Rav Nosson Finkel got on the plane and traveled to Lakewood and got to Lakewood, where the big yeshiva is in America, in Lakewood and New Jersey, and went to speak there, he got up to speak in a room. The room was packed with 5,000 people. And many of those people in the room, probably when they learned in the yeshiva in Mir, left the base medrash when he walked in. Because so long as he's my rush yeshiva, who is available all the time, who I can talk to anytime I want to, no big deal. As long as great people are around, we don't appreciate them. And therefore, what Rab Sorotskin's son, actually, he quotes in the name of his son, al -Khanun. He says, when a tzaddik leaves the town, it's only then that the community actually realizes, wait a minute, do you have any idea what we had? Do you have any idea what kind of great person graced our town? Someone like fill in the blank. What an unbelievable, amazing thing. 
and nobody appreciated it. And only when the person leaves the town or passes on, does the town suddenly realize, hey, wait a second, something massive is missing over here. How come everything's going a little bit pear-shaped? Well, well, what do you think? What's missing now? Oh, right. That's the issue. And what he says is, the shame is that whilst people are alive, they are not appreciated. And so many times we only appreciate the people whom we need to appreciate the most after they pass away. So I remember hearing Rabbi Zechariah Wallerstein, the Quran of the Zechatzaki used to say he was a very famous rabbi in America, Rabbi Wallerstein. He dealt with a lot of teens that went off, went off the derch, were at risk, met both men and women. He was a you know phenomenal individual, a really phenomenal individual. And one of the things he used to say is I used to hear people saying again and again, young children or even adults standing in front of their parents are on in front of their parents coffin and saying why did you leave me i had so much more than i wanted to tell you i had so much more time i wanted to spend with you where did you go i don't know if you've ever heard people say that spouses you hear them sometimes saying that you hear children saying that about their parents it's a terrible thing when you're standing in front of the Aron in front of the coffin of somebody of a loved one, and you feel bereft, and you're like, where did you go? Why did you leave me? But he said, the same person, if you had said to them five days ago, do you want to have lunch with your mom? I'm too busy. You know, four days ago, your mom really needed a visitor. Do you want to? I, I got too much work to do. And then the mother passed away, goes, I, I had so much more time I wanted to spend with you. Well, when she was around, you didn't spend any time with her. Only now do you wake up and say, I wish I would have spent more time with her. Why didn't you take advantage when she was around? Parents, spouses, friends, rabbis, anything. You know, there's so many different people you could look at towards and say, I didn't take advantage of this person fully whilst I had the opportunity. And it's only when they leave that I suddenly wake up and go, oh my goodness, that was stupid. What a blunder. Why did I let them leave without getting the maximum from them that I could? So he says, the first thing that he says, when Yaakov leaves Be'er Sheva, it makes a roshim. It makes a difference to the town. But the problem is it only makes a difference to the town once he leaves. Yaakov walks out and everybody goes, where'd he go? Oh, he's a great man. Why did we lose him? So we were such a great man. Why didn't you make the most of him while he still lived with you? What would you let him go for? But people do that. And only in hindsight do they wake up and go, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Maybe that wasn't such a clever idea. <laughs> yeah, maybe. But wake up. He says, but then the Yetzirah comes to you and he says the next thing, which is a, an unbelievable thing. He says, then he says, Kivo Hashemesh, which is a continuation of the verse. The sun has set already. It's done. That boat has sailed. It's finished, so he's gone. Now, what do you want to do? You want to replace the bed? You're never going to find a replacement for him. Will you ever find a replacement as great as fill in the blank? You won't. And therefore, don't bother. Just don't bother. So I'm not talking about loved ones now, because loved ones are irreplaceable anyway. But you have great people in a town and a great person leaves the town. So you had a great Rosh Hashiva, you had a great dying, you had a great Rav and he leaves and the whole community is very, very sad and very upset and now he's gone. And then you say to yourself, you know what? Can't replace him anyway. Let's just get somebody on a totally different caliber. Well, first things first, try to replace the man. Try to find somebody who's almost on the caliber. Don't just say to yourself, well, I can never replace him and therefore I'll just settle for fifth best or 10th best. Because that's what happens to us. Once we lose somebody great, we often say to ourselves, oh, you know what? That's a shame. I should have realized more. I should have taken more in whilst he lived with us. It's a shame I didn't, but all right, that's happened. It happened. Am I going to be able to ever replace him? No, we'll never be able to replace him. All right, so let's not even bother. That's the next trip. Number one, you didn't realize that how great the man was while he was alive. Number two, once he leaves you, you don't try to replace him like for like, almost like for like, you just totally give in. And that, he says, is a very, very sad, a sad reality amongst people. Okay, moving on. 
We have over here the story of Rachel and Leah marrying, both marrying Yaakov Avinu. And what happens is Leah has children. And to be exact, at this point of the story that we're in, they have four children. Leah has four children. She has the first one she calls him Reuve. And the second one she calls Shimon. So Rashi, the Torah tells us, we're on page 152. And there the Torah tells us. You know, before we even get to that, I'd like to say one other idea. This has to do something with something that I spoke about two, three weeks ago, and I heard a continuation to this idea from Rabbi Shlomo Fahi, which I thought was very, very beautiful. And I, I'd like to sort of bring this up before I go into the next idea of Hapamoid Es Hashem. So you have over here, Yaakov Avinu is meant to get married to whom? To Rochel. And what does he say to Lavan? I'm going to work for you for seven years for Rochel, your younger daughter. And he said those three things because he wants to make it absolutely clear. Rochel, not any Rochel, your daughter. Don't rename any of your daughters your younger daughter, okay? Don't play this Leia shtick because Yaakov knows that Lavan is a bit of a shyster and he's going to try to get something. He's going to try to do him in. And then Yaakov even makes a deal with Rachel, and he gives her certain simonim, he gives her certain signs and symbols, and therefore, if they would stand on the chuppah, Yaakov has to say something, and Rachel has to say something back, and if he turns to the woman and he says, what's the code? She goes, what code? The code we made up. I don't know. Ha! Caught you! That was his, that was his tactic. That was his plan. Why did the plan, by the way, fail? Why did it fail? Rachel handed over the simonim. Yeah, she gave over the signs. And now, Yaakov Avinu wakes up in the morning, Behine Hilea, which in and of itself, the situation and the story as it unfolds at that morning is not somewhere where I would like to be. Imagine waking up in the morning thinking you have somebody next to you and the roommate that you thought was sleeping next to you has been exchanged for somebody else. And in this instance, it's not just a roommate, it's a wife, right? Imagine waking up and turning to your side, ah, what are you doing here? Yeah? What are, you, what are you doing here? What? What are you doing here? I didn't marry you. What are you doing in my bed? Can you imagine the fright? The fright will be, un, it's unreal. And at that point, what does Leah say to him? You married me last night. I don't know what you're talking about. I didn't marry you. I married Rachel. No, you didn't. You married me, right? I've been here all night long. You didn't marry Rachel. To which Yaakov then goes, oh my goodness me. I can't believe he tricked me. I can't believe he fooled me. And he goes to Lavan. And he says to Lavan, this is on page 150. Verse 25. Perak of was in the morning. Behold, it is Leah. And he says to Lavan, what have you done to me? Didn't I work for you for Why did you fool me? Why did you deceive me? What's the matter with you? What does Lavan say? Bayama Lavan. Lavan says, We don't play like that. To give the younger one before the older one. Now, if you remember, I said an idea two, three, two weeks ago, Pashas Chayasara. And Rabbi Farhi takes this idea and takes it to the next step, which is what I want to share with you, which I think is unbelievable. It's just reading into what happens over here and understanding Laban and who he is. So if you remember, we spoke about it in Pasha's Chayasara. It says, Laban runs out to greet the man who's standing at the well. But then at a later point, it tells you. So the verse tells us as follows. When Laban hears what is, let's just get the verse correctly. Um, uh, 
Lavan. Rivkan has a brother who's called Lavan. Lavan runs, runs out to the man outside to that well. But it was when he saw the nose ring. And the bracelets on his sister's hand. When he hears this, when he heard the words of Rivka's sister saying, This is what the man said to me. He came to the man. He comes to the man while he's standing outside by the camels. So over there, we explained, I think the Mesha Chochma says, but many others say this as well, that what happened is as follows. Originally, Lavan hears Avram Avinu's household is here to find a match. A match? Who's a great match? Me. My sister, me. I'm the match. Avram Avinu also had a daughter, and he thought to himself, I'm going to go out. I'm going to get married to the daughter. So Laman starts running. goes, I'm yippee. Like he's running outside. You get this, like, you know, the guy's skipping along. And as he passes his sister, he goes, hey, what's with all the new jewelry? She goes, oh, did you not hear? No. He says, well, the guy showed up. This guy came from Avram's household. And he comes here, and guess who he's looking for? He's looking for a match for whom? For Yitzchak, not for Avram Avinu's daughter. And suddenly, Lama was like, Shh, deflated the entire balloon. Because what's happened now? What has really happened now? Lavan realizes that actually, it's not for him. And not only that, who was older? Lavan or Rivka? Lavan was older. Lavan was older. We see how Lavan makes the negotiations for his daughter, for his sister Rivka, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And so therefore, Lavan comes out to the man, but he comes with a lot less enthusiasm and alacrity as he was more than what he was going to do originally. Originally, it says that he was by Yorati run, and then after it says by Yovalish, he comes to the man, he says, listen, you want to come inside, come inside. But now he's already lost all his enthusiasm. But beyond that, what's happening now? What is now going on in Lavan's head? He's saying, wait a second. They're going to give away my sister before me. They give away my sister before me. Who are they giving away? Who's going first, the younger or the older? <laughs> the younger. And Lovin goes, that's not okay. That's just not okay. The younger doesn't go before the older. It was my turn. I should have gone first. And so he's pretty upset. Now, by the way, mind you, do you know how many years have passed since that story in Pasha's Kaisar? Anybody want to give a venture a guess? How many years later is this story now with Rachel and Leah? Quite a long time afterwards. Do you know how many years afterwards? Let's work it out. The story with Rachel and Leah works like this. It is 20 years until Yaakov Avinu has children. That's 20. He was 77 when he reached Charon, Yaakov Avinu. So now 97 years down the line. And then he worked for him for seven years, which makes 104 years. We're now 104 years down the line. And this is the moment that lovin has been waiting for. This is it. Because it comes to marrying off. It's 104 years, but you know, there's nothing like a good family grudge. Nothing like it, right? This is the moment he's been waiting for. Oh, good Bruges. What happens now is, Lovan says, I'm going to give Leia to him. And he wakes up in the morning and he goes, Hey, you! Yeah, you, Lovan! What's with that? Why did you give me this woman? I worked for Rachel. Why did you give me Leia? And Lovan now's got his beautiful line. And he says to Yaakov Avinu, we don't do this in our household. None of this youngers go before olders. Sound familiar? Sound familiar? Does somebody have a bit of a complex over here? Is somebody trying to get back his own? Absolutely. 104 years down the line. And Lovin's been waiting for this situation. And finally, the situation opens up and he hands over his older daughter. And Yaakov says, but I, uh, I, was, I went for the younger one says no such thing do you remember i got skipped over 
Do you remember the younger one went before the older one? Not in my household is that going to happen. No younger one is going to go before the older one. The older one goes first. And who feels vindicated? Lavan feels vindicated because he says, I got skipped over. I'm going to screw you with the same thing. I'm going to give you a piece and a taste of your own medicine. You want to take the young one before the old one? I'm not going to let you. You're going to get the old one first. We don't do this kind of shtick. Amazing. Absolutely amazing. To think about the lengths that a Russia would go to just to get back his own. Just to be able to take a little bit of revenge, to feel a little bit better and a little bit more vindicated and a little bit more like somebody really, oh, I deserve that. I deserve that. It's amazing what we could do. It's amazing what Nakama, what revenge could make people do. It's amazing the middos people can have. You can read about the middos of Avram Avinu, of Yitzhak and of Yaakov in the Pasha, as we spoke about in the beginning. Also, you have a great tzaddik and you can marvel at the middos. You can marvel at the way they behave. But you could also marvel at the depths of depravity that mankind is able to get to. And unfortunately, if you ever read history, if you spend time actually learning history, you will realize that however low you think man could ever fall, it's nothing. We can go much lower. Oh, you can lower your expectations on that one. You know, unfortunately, that's who we are. And you see over here, Lovan will hold a gripe and a grudge for 104 years. And when it comes to it, he will take Yaakov Avinu, who's worked for him honestly for seven years, and hand him the wrong wife and go, I don't have my ass. Just to get back at him. Just to have his own. Just to feel a little bit better. That's fair. It's not fair. But when you're dealing with twisted people, they will wait for the opportunity and then get at you. And so you have to learn from that. If people are willing to hold on to grudges for that long, how long should you hold on to owing someone something? Somebody's done me a favor. It's 10 years later. It's 20 years later. It could be 50 years later. You owe them in return. So, you know, we have, I've had it at times. I remember when I was in Israel, I was a young boy. I was 18, 19. I used to call up these people. I'd never met these people, never heard them before. And my mother, my father say, call up Mr. Friedman. Mr. Friedman will have you. And you call them up. He says, hello, who's this? Hi, my name is David Eisenberg. He goes, hi, can I help you? He goes, yeah, I am. Rabbi Eisenberg for Vienna, son. Rabbi Eisenberg, son, how are you? You know, the tone changes. How are you? You're calling from Israeli number. How can I help you? Well, I'm actually live around the corner from you now. Would you like to come for a Shabbos meal? We'd love to have you. It'd be an honor to have you. Right? Where does that come from? Like, if they didn't know who I was, you'd call like, hello? Yeah, hello. Who is this? My name is David Eisenberg. I found your telephone number in one of the local phone books. Yeah, can I help you? Yeah, I'd like to come for a Shabbos meal. No, who do you think you are, right? But like this, you sort of like, and some of these people, it's like, it's years and years in coming. People are like 30, 40 years ago, knew my parents and they're like, of course I know your parents. I remember your dad when he was, when he was still younger, when he wasn't a rabbi. Or I remember your mom before she was married. Of course, I'd love to have you. It's that kind of thing. We remember these kind of favors and we pay them back. Sometimes years, sometimes decades later. And if somebody can do something negative and hurt somebody so badly so many years later, isn't it correct for us instead to learn the opposite lesson? Hold on to gratitude. If you owe someone something in maybe 20, 30 years down the line, you get the opportunity to pay them back, grab that opportunity. Make the best of it. Make the most of it. Because that's really an amazing thing to be able to do. To hold on to the feeling of gratitude and to say, I owe you. One day, one day I'll give it back. And then to give it back, that's much greater than taking revenge like that. Okay, that's it for tonight. Thank you for all those who joined us on Facebook Live. For those who joined on, on Zoom, for those who joined on Terry, any time of those in person, look forward to seeing you in Mitzvah Shem next week. Thank you for joining me. And Mitzvah Shem, we'll see you next week.